Chapter 7 Old Narnia in Danger The place where they had met the fawns was, of course, Dancing Lawn itself, and here Caspian and his friends remained till the night of the Great Council. To sleep under the stars, to drink nothing but well water, and to live chiefly on nuts and wild fruit was a strange experience for Caspian after his bed with silken sheets and a tapestried chamber at the castle, with meals laid out on gold and silver dishes in the anteroom and attendants ready at his call. But he had never enjoyed himself more, never had sleep been more refreshing, nor food tasted more savory, and he began already to harden, and his face wore a kinglier look. When the great night came, and his various strange subjects came stealing into the lawn by ones and twos and threes, or by sixes and sevens, the moon then shining almost at her full, his heart swelled as he saw their numbers and heard their greetings. All whom he had met were there, bulgy bears and red dwarfs and black dwarfs, moles and badgers, hares and hedgehogs, and others whom he had not yet seen, five satyrs as red as foxes, the whole contingent of talking mice, armed to the teeth and following a shrill trumpet, some owls, the old raven of Ravenscour. Last of all, and this took Caspian's breath away, with the centaurs came a small but genuine giant, Wimbleweather of Dead Man's Hill, carrying on his back a basket full of rather seasick dwarves who had accepted his offer of a lift and were now wishing they had walked instead. The bulgy bears were very anxious to have the feast first and leave the council till afterward, perhaps till tomorrow. Reepicheep and his mice said that councils and feasts could both wait and proposed storming Moraz in his own castle that very night. Pattertwig and the other squirrels said they could talk and eat at the same time, so why not have the council and feast all at once? The moles proposed throwing up entrenchments round the lawn before they did anything else. The fawns thought it would be better to begin with a solemn dance. The old raven, while agreeing with the bears that it would take too long to have a full council before supper, begged to be allowed to give a brief address to the whole company. But Caspian and the centaurs and the dwarves overruled all these suggestions and insisted on holding a real council of war at once. When all the other creatures had been persuaded to sit down quietly in a great circle, and then, with more difficulty, they had got Pattertwig to stop running to and fro and saying, Silence! Silence! Everyone for the king's speech! Caspian, feeling a little nervous, got up. Narnians, he began, but he never got any further, for at that very moment Camillo the Hare said, Hush! There's a man somewhere near. They were all creatures of the wild, accustomed to being hunted, and they all became still as statues. The beasts all turned their noses in the direction which Camillo had indicated. "'Smells like man, and yet not quite like man,' whispered Truffle Hunter. "'It's getting steadily nearer,' said Camillo. Two badgers and you three dwarves, with your bows at the ready, go softly off to meet it,' said Caspian. "'We'll settle and said a black dwarf grimly, fitting a shaft to his bowstring. "'Don't shoot it if it is alone,' said Caspian. "'Catch it.' Why? asked the dwarf. Do as you're told, said Glenstorm the centaur. Everyone waited in silence while the three dwarfs and two badgers trotted stealthily across to the trees on the northwest side of the lawn. Then came a sharp dwarfish cry, Stop! Who goes there? And a sudden spring. A moment later a voice, which Caspian knew well, could be heard saying, All right, all right, I'm unarmed. Take my wrists if you like, worthy badgers, but don't bite right through them. I want to speak to the king. Dr. Cornelius, cried Caspian with joy, and rushed forward to greet his old tutor. Everyone else crowded round. Pa, said Nickabrick, a renegade dwarf, a half and halfer. Shall I pass my sword through its throat? Be quiet, Nickabrick, said Trumpkin. The creature can't help its ancestry. This is my greatest friend and the savior of my life, said Caspian, and anyone who doesn't like his company may leave my army at once. Dearest doctor, I am glad to see you again. However did you find us out? "'By a little use of simple magic, your majesty,' said the doctor, who was still puffing and blowing from having walked so fast. "'But there's no time to go into that now. We must all fly from this place at once. You are already betrayed, and Miraz is on the move. Before midday tomorrow you will be surrounded.' "'Betrayed,' said Caspian, "'and by whom?' "'Another renegade dwarf, no doubt,' said Nickabrick. "'By your horse, Destrier,' said Dr. Cornelius. "'The poor brute knew no better. "'When you were knocked off, of course, "'he went dawdling back to his stable in the castle. "'Then the secret of your flight was known. "'I made myself scarce, "'having no wish to be questioned about it "'in Miraz's torture chamber. "'I had a pretty good guess from my crystal "'as to where I should find you. "'But all day, that was the day before yesterday, "'I saw Miraz's tracking parties out in the woods. "'Yesterday I learned that his army is out. "'I don't think some of your, um, Pure-blooded dwarves have as much woodcraft as might be expected. You've left tracks all over the place, great carelessness, 
At any rate, something has warned Mraz that old Narnia is not so dead as he had hoped, and he is on the move. Hurrah! said a very shrill and small voice from somewhere at the doctor's feet. Let them come! All I ask is that the king will put me and my people in the front. What on earth? said Dr. Cornelius. Has your majesty got grasshoppers or mosquitoes in your army? Then, after stooping down and peering carefully through his spectacles, he broke into a laugh. By the lion, he swore, it's a mouse. Signor Mouse, I desire your better acquaintance. I am honored by meeting so valiant a beast. My friendship you shall have, learned man, piped Reepicheep. And any dwarf or giant in the army who does not give you good language shall have my sword to reckon with. Is there time for this foolery, asked Nickabrick. What are our plans, battle or flight? Battle if need be, said Trumpkin, but we are hardly ready for it yet, and this is no very defensible place. I don't like the idea of running away, said Caspian. Hear him, hear him, said the bulgy bears. Whatever we do, don't let's have any running, especially not before supper, and not too soon after, either. Those who, do, who run first do not always run last, said, centaur, said the centaur, and why should we let the enemy choose our position instead of choosing it ourselves? Let us find a strong place. That's wise, your majesty, that's wise, said Truffle Hunter. But where are we to go? asked several voices. Your majesty, said Dr. Cornelius, and all you variety of creatures, I think we must fly east and down the river to the great woods. The Telmarines hate that region. They have always been afraid of the sea and of something that may come over the sea. That is why they have let the great woods grow up. If traditions speak true, the ancient Care Paravel was at the river mouth. All that part is friendly to us and hateful to our enemies. We must go to Aslan's How. Aslan's How, said several voices. We do not know what it is. It lies within the skirts of the great woods, and it is a huge mound which Narnians raised in very ancient times over a very magical place, where there stood, and perhaps still stands, a very magical stone. Uh, the mound is all hollowed out within into galleries and caves, and the stone is in the central cave of all. There is room in the mound for all our stores, and those of us who have most need of cover and are most accustomed to underground life can be lodged in the caves. The rest of us can lie in the wood. At a pinch, all of us, except this worthy giant, could retreat into the mound itself, and there we should be beyond the reach of every danger except famine. It's a good thing we have a learned man among us, said Truffle Hunter, but Trumpkin muttered under his breath, Soup and celery! I wish our leaders would think less about these old wives' tales and more about victuals and arms. But all approved of Cornelius's proposal, and that very night, half an hour later, they were on the march. Before sunrise, they arrived at Oslan's How. It was certainly an awesome place, a round green hill on top of another hill, long since grown over with trees, and one little low doorway leading into it. The tunnels inside were a perfect maze till you got to know them, and they were lined and roofed with smooth stones, and on the stones, peering in the twilight, Caspian saw strange characters and snaky patterns and pictures in which the form of a lion was repeated again and again. It all seemed to belong to an even older Narnia than the Narnia of which his nurse had told him. It was after they had taken up their quarters in, in and around the howl that fortune began to turn against them. King Moraz's scouts soon found their new lair, and he and his army arrived on the edge of the woods. And, as so often happens, the enemy turned out stronger than they had reckoned. Caspian's heart sank as he saw company after company arriving, and though Miraz's men may have been afraid of going into the wood, they were, they were even more afraid of Miraz, and with him in command they carried battle deeply into it and sometimes almost to the how itself. Caspian and other captains, of course, made many sorties into the open country. Thus, there was fighting on most days, and sometimes by night as well. But Caspian's party had, on the whole, the worst of it. At last there came a night when everything had gone as badly as possible, and the rain, which had been falling heavily all day, had ceased at nightfall only to give place to raw cold. That morning Caspian had arranged what was his biggest battle yet, and all, the, and all had hung their hopes on it. He, with most of the dwarfs, was to have fallen on the king's right wing at daybreak, and then, when they were heavily engaged, giant Wimbleweather, with the centaurs and some of the fiercest beasts, was to have broken out from another place and endeavored to cut the king's right off from the rest of the army. But it had all failed. No one had warned Caspian, because no one in these later days of Narnia remembered, that giants are not at all clever. Poor Wimbleweather, though as brave as a lion, was a true giant in that respect. He had broken out at the wrong time and from the wrong place, and both his party and Caspian's had suffered badly and done the enemy little harm. The best of the bears had been hurt, a centaur terribly wounded, and there were few in Caspian's party who had not lost blood. 
It was a gloomy company that huddled under the dripping trees to eat their scanty supper. The gloomiest of all was giant Wimbleweather. He knew it was all his fault. He sat in silence, shedding big tears, which collected on the end of his nose and then fell off with a huge splash on the whole bivouac of mice, who had just been beginning to get warm and drowsy. They all jumped up, shaking the water out of their ears and wringing their little blankets, and asked the giant in shrill but forcible voices whether he thought they weren't wet enough without this sort of thing. And then other people woke up and told the mice they had been enrolled as scouts and not as a concert party and asked why they couldn't keep quiet. And Wimbleweather tiptoed away to find some place where he could be miserable in peace and stepped on somebody's tail and somebody, they said afterward, it was a fox, bit him. And so everyone was out of temper. Mm -hmm. But in the secret and magical chamber at the heart of the how, King Caspian with Cornelius and the Badger and Nickabrick and Trumpkin were at council. Thick pillars of ancient workmanship supported the roof. In the center was the stone itself, a stone table split right down the center and covered with what had once been writing of some kind, but ages of wind and rain and snow had almost worn them away in old times when the stone table had stood on the hilltop and the mound had not yet been built above it. They were not using the table nor sitting round it. It was too magic a thing for any common use. They sat on logs a little way from it, and between them was a rough wooden table on which stood a rude clay lamp lighting up their pale faces and throwing big shadows on the walls. If your majesty is ever to use the horn, said Truffle Hunter, I think the time has now come. Caspian had, of course, told them of his treasure several days ago. We are certainly in great need, answered Caspian, but it's hard to be sure we are at our greatest, supposing there came an even worse need and we had already used it. By that argument, said Nickabrick, your majesty will never use it until it's too late. I agree with that, said Dr. Cornelius. And what do you think, Trumpkin, asked Caspian. Oh, as for me, said the Red Dwarf, who had been listening with complete indifference, your majesty knows I think the horn, and that bit of broken stone over there, and your great King Peter, and your Lion Aslan are all eggs in moonshine. It's all one to me when your majesty blows the horn. All I insist on is that the army is told nothing about it. There's no good raising hopes of magical help, which, as I think, are sure to be disappointed. Then, in the name of Aslan, we will wind Queen Susan's horn, said Caspian. There's one thing, sire, said Dr. Cornelius, that should perhaps be done first. We do not know what form the help will take. It might call Aslan himself from oversea, but I think it is more likely to call Peter the High King and his mighty consorts down from the high past. But in either case, I do not think we can be sure that the help will come to this very spot. You never said a truer word, put in Trumpkin. I think, went on the learned man, that they, or he, will come back to one or other of the ancient places of Narnia. This, where we now sit, is the most ancient and most deeply magical of all, and here I think the answer is likeliest to come. But there are two others. One is Lantern Waste, upriver, west of Beaver's Dam, where the royal children first appeared in Narnia, as the records tell. The author is down at the river mouth, where their castle of Ker Paravel once stood. And if Aslan himself comes, that would be the best place for meeting him, too, for every story says that he is the son of the great emperor over the sea, and over the sea he will pass. I should like very much to send messengers to both places, to Lantern Waste and the River Mouth, to receive them, or him, or it. Just as I thought, muttered Trumpkin, the first result of all this foolery is not to bring us help, but to lose us two fighters. Who would you think of sending, Dr. Cornelius? asked Caspian. Squirrels are best for getting through enemy country without being caught, said Truffle Hunter. All our squirrels, and we haven't many, said Nickabrick, are rather flighty. The only one I'd trust on a job like that would be Pattertwig. Let it be Pattertwig, then, said King Caspian. And who for our other messenger? I know you'd go, Truffle Hunter, but you haven't the speed, nor you, Dr. Cornelius. I won't go, said Nickabrick. With all these humans and beasts about, there must be a dwarf here to see the dwarfs are fairly treated. Thimbles and thunderstorms, cried Trumpkin in a rage. Is that how you speak to the king? Send me, sire. I'll go. But I thought you didn't believe in the horn, Trumpkin, said Caspian. No more I do, your majesty. But what's that got to do with it? I might as well die on a wild goose chase as die here. You are my king. I know the difference between giving advice and taking orders. You've had my advice, and now it's the time for orders. I will never forget this, Trumpkin, said Caspian. Send for Pattertwig, one of you, and when shall I blow the horn? I would wait for sunrise, your majesty, said Dr. Cornelius. That sometimes has an effect in operations of white magic. 
A few minutes later, Pattertwig arrived and had his task explained to him. As he was, like many squirrels, full of courage and dash and energy and excitement and mischief, not to say conceit, he no sooner heard it than he was eager to be off. It was arranged that he should run for Lantern Waste while Trumpkin made the shorter journey to the river mouth. After a hasty meal, they both set off with the fervent thanks and good wishes of the king, the badger, and Cornelius. Chapter 8. How They Left the Island "'And so,' said Trumpkin, for, as you have realized, it was he who had been telling all this story to the four children sitting on the grass in the ruined hall of Care Paravel. "'And so I put a crust or two in my pocket, left behind all weapons but my dagger, and took to the woods in the gray of the morning. I'd been plugging away for many hours when there came a sound that I'd never heard the like of in my born days. Eh, I won't forget that. The whole air was full of it, loud as thunder, but far longer, cool and sweet as music over water, but strong enough to shake the woods. And I said to myself, if that's not the horn, call me a rabbit. And a moment later I wondered why he hadn't blown it sooner. "'What time was it?' asked Edmund. "'Between nine and ten of the clock,' said Trumpkin. "'Just when we were at the railway station,' said all the children, and looked at one another with shining eyes. "'Please go on,' said Lucy to the dwarf. "'Well, as I was saying, I wondered, but I went on as hard as I could pelt. I kept on all night, and then, when it was half light this morning, as if I'd got no more sense than a giant, I risked a short cut across open country to cut off a big loop of the river, and I was caught.' Not by the army, but by a pompous old fool who has charge of a little castle which is Moraz's last stronghold toward the coast. I needn't tell you they got no true tale out of me, but I was a dwarf and that was enough. But lobsters and lollipops, it's a good thing the Seneschal was a pompous fool. Anyone else would have run me through there and then. But nothing would do for him short of a grand execution, sending me down to the ghosts in the full ceremonial way. And then this young lady, he nodded at Susan, does her bit of archery, and it was pretty shooting, let me tell you, and here we are. And without my armor, for of course they took that. He knocked out and refilled his pipe. Great Scott, said Peter, so it was the horn, your own horn, so, own horn, Sue, that dragged us all off that seat on the platform yesterday morning. I can hardly believe it, yet it all fits in. I don't know why you shouldn't believe it, said Lucy, if you believe in magic at all. Aren't there lots of stories about magic forcing people out of one place, out of one world, into another? I mean, when a magician in the Arabian Nights calls up a djinn, it has to come. We had to come, just like that. Yes, said Peter, I suppose what makes it feel so queer is that in the stories it's always someone in our world who does the calling. One doesn't really think about where the djinn's coming from. And now we know what it feels like for the djinn, said Edmund with a chuckle. Golly, it's a bit uncomfortable to know that we can be whistled for like that. It's worse than what Father says about living at the mercy of the telephone. But we want to be here, don't we, said Lucy, if Aslan wants us? Meanwhile, said the dwarf, what are we to do? I suppose I'd better go back to King Caspian and tell him no help has come. No help, said Susan, but it has worked, and here we are. Uh, um, yes, to be sure. <laughs> I see that, said the dwarf, whose pipe seemed to be blocked. At any rate, he made himself very busy cleaning it. But, well, I mean... But don't you yet see who we are, shouted Lucy. You are stupid. I suppose you are the four children out of the old stories, said Trumpkin. And I'm very glad to meet you, of course. And it's very interesting, no doubt. But no offense, and he hesitated again. Do get on and say whatever you're going to say, said Edmund. Well then, no offense, said Trumpkin, but you know, the king and Truffle Hunter and Dr. Cornelius were expecting, well, if you see what I mean, help. Uh, to put it another way, I think they'd been imagining you as great warriors. As it is, we're awfully fond of children and all that, but just at the moment, in the middle of a war, but I'm sure you understand. You mean you think we're no good, said Edmund, getting red in the face. Now, pray, don't be offended, interrupted the dwarf. I assure you, my dear little friends. Little from you is really a bit too much, said Edmund, jumping up. I suppose you don't believe we won the Battle of Baruna. Well, you can say what you like about me, because I know... There's no good losing our tempers, said Peter. Let's fit him out with fresh armor and fit ourselves out from the treasure chamber and have a talk after that. I don't quite see the point, began Edmund, but Lucy whispered in his ear, hadn't we better do what Peter says? He is the high king, you know, and I think he has an idea. So Edmund agreed, and by the aid of his torch, they all, including Trumpkin, went down the steps again into the dark coldness and dusty splendor of the treasure house. 
The dwarf's eyes glistened as he saw the wealth that lay on the shelves, though he had to stand on tiptoes to do so, and he muttered to himself, it would never do to let Nickabrick see this, never. They found easily enough a mail shirt for him, a sword, a helmet, a shield, a bow and quiver full of arrows, all of dwarfish size. The helmet was of copper set with rubies, and there was gold on the hilt of the sword. Trumpkin had never seen, much less carried, so much wealth in all his life. The children also put on mail shirts and helmets. A sword and shield were found for Edmund, and a bow for Lucy. Peter and Susan were, of course, already carrying their gifts. As they came back up the stairway, jingling in their mail, and already looking and feeling more like Narnians and less like schoolchildren, the two boys were behind, apparently making some plan. Lucy heard Edmund say, No, let me do it. It will be more of a sucks for him if I win, and less of a letdown for us all if I fail. All right, Ed, said Peter. When they came out into the daylight, Edmund turned to the dwarf very politely and said, I've got something to ask you. Kids like us don't often have the chance of meeting a great warrior like you. Would you like, would you have a little fencing match with me? It would, but it would be frightfully decent. But lad, said Trumpkin, these swords are sharp. I know, said Edmund, but I'll never get anywhere near you and you'll be quite clever enough to disarm me without doing me any damage. It's a dangerous game, said Trumpkin, but since you make such a point of it, I'll try a pass or two. Both swords were out in a moment, and the three others jumped off the dais and stood watching. It was well worth it. It was not like the silly fighting you see with broadswords on the stage. It was not even like the rapier fighting, which you sometimes see rather better done. This was real broadsword fighting. The great thing is to slash at your enemy's legs and feet, because they are the part that have no armor. And when he slashes at yours, to jump with both feet off the ground so that his blow goes under them. This gave the dwarf an advantage, because Edmund, being much taller, had always to be stooping. I don't think Edmund would have had a chance if he had fought Trumpkin 24 hours earlier, but the air of Narnia had been working on him ever since they arrived on the island, and all his old battles came back to him, and his arms and fingers remembered their old skill. He was King Edmund once more. Round and round the two combatants circled, stroke after stroke they gave, and Susan, who never could learn to like this sort of thing, shouted out, Oh, do be careful! Oops, I cut off your feet. And then, so quickly that no one, unless they knew, as Peter did, could quite see how it happened, Edmunds flashed his sword round with a peculiar twist. The dwarf's sword flew out of his grip, and Trumpkin was wringing his empty hand as you do after a sting from a cricket bat. Not hurt, I hope, my dear little friend, said Edmund, patting, panting a little and returning his own sword to its sheath. I see the point, said Trumpkin dryly. You know a trick I never learned. That's quite true, put in Peter. The best swordsman in the world may be disarmed by a trick that's new to him. I think it's only fair to give Trumpkin a chance at something else. Will you have a shooting match with my sister? There are no tricks in archery, you know. Ah, you're jokers you are, said the dwarf. I begin to see, as if I didn't know how she can shoot after what happened this morning. All the same, I'll have a try. He spoke gruffly, but his eyes brightened, for he was a famous bowman among his own people. All five of them came out into the courtyard. "'What's to be the target?' asked Peter. "'I think that apple hanging over the wall on the branch there would do,' said Susan. "'That'll do nicely, lass,' said Trumpkin. "'You mean the yellow one near the middle of the arch?' "'No, not that,' said Susan. "'The red one up above, over the battlement.' "'The dwarf's face fell. "'Looks more like a cherry than an apple,' he muttered, "'but he said nothing out loud. "'They tossed up for first shot.' greatly to the interest of Trumpkin, who had never seen a coin tossed before, and Susan lost. They were to shoot from the top of the steps that led from the hall into the courtyard. Everyone could see from the way the dwarf took his position and handled his bow that he knew what he was about. Twang went the string. It was an excellent shot. The tiny apple shook as the arrow passed and a leaf came fluttering down. Then Susan went to the top of the steps and strung her bow. She was not enjoying her match half so much as Edmund had enjoyed his, not because she had any doubt about hitting the apple, but because Susan was so tender-hearted that she almost hated to beat someone who had been beaten already. The dwarf watched her keenly as she drew the shaft to her ear. A moment later, with a little soft thump which they could all hear in that quiet place, the apple fell to the grass with Susan's arrow in it. "'Oh, well done, Sue!' shouted the other children. "'It wasn't really any better than yours,' said Susan to the dwarf. "'I think there was a tiny breath of wind as you shot.' No, there wasn't, said Trumpkin. Don't tell me. I know when I'm fairly beaten. I won't even say that the scar of my last wound catches me a bit when I get my arm well back. Oh, are you wounded, asked Lucy. Do let me look. It's not a sight for little girls, began Trumpkin, but then he suddenly checked himself. There I go talking like a fool again, he said. I suppose you're as likely to be a great surgeon as your brother was to be a great swordsman or your sister to be a great archer. 
He sat down on the steps and took off his hauberk and slipped down his little shirt, showing an arm hairy and muscular, in proportion as a sailor's, though not much bigger than a child's. There was a clumsy bandage on the shoulder, which Lucy proceeded to unroll. Underneath, the cut looked very nasty, and there was a good deal of swelling. Oh, poor Trumpkin, said Lucy, how horrid. Then she carefully dripped onto it one single drop of the cordial from her flask. Hello, eh? What have you done? said Trumpkin. But however he turned his head and squinted and whisked his beard to and fro, he couldn't quite see his own shoulder. Then he felt it as well as he could, getting his arms and fingers into very difficult positions, as you do when you're trying to scratch a place that's just out of reach. Then he swung his arm and raised it and tried the muscles, and finally jumped to his feet, crying, Giants and junipers! It's cured! It's as good as new! After that, he burst into a great laugh and said, Well, I've made as big a fool of myself as ever a dwarf did. No offense, I hope. My humble duty to your majesty's all humble duty. And thanks for my life, my cure, my breakfast, and my lesson. The children all said it was quite all right not to mention it. And now, said Peter, if you've really decided to believe in us, I have, said the dwarf. It's quite clear what we have to do. We must join King Caspian at once. The sooner the better, said Trumpkin. My being such a fool has already wasted about an hour. It's about two days' journey, the way you came, said Peter. For us, I mean, we can't walk all day and night like you dwarves. Then he turned to the others. What Trumpkin calls Aslan's how is obviously the stone table itself. You remember it was about a half a day's march, or a little less, from there down to the fords of Baruna. Baruna's bridge, we call it, said Trumpkin. There was no bridge in our time, said Peter. And then from Baruna down to here was another day in a bit. We used to get home about tea time on the second day, going easily. Going hard, we could do the whole thing in a day and a half, perhaps. But remember, it's all woods now, said Trumpkin, and there are enemies to dodge. Look here, said Edmund. Need we go by the same way that our dear little friend came? No more of that, your majesty, if you love me, said the dwarf. Very well, said Edmund. May I say our DLF? Oh, Edmund, said Susan, don't keep on at him like that. That's all right, lass. I mean, your majesty, said Trumpkin with a chuckle. A jive won't raise a blister. And after that, they often called him the DLF till they'd almost forgotten what it meant. As I was saying, continued Edmund, we needn't go that way. Why shouldn't we row a little south till we come to Glasswater Creek and row up it? That brings us up behind the hill of the stone table, and we'll be safe while we're at sea. If we start at once, we can be at the head of Glasswater before dark, get a few hours, few hours sleep, and be with Caspian pretty early tomorrow. What a thing it is to know the coast, said Trumpkin. None of us knows anything about Glasswater. What about food, asked Susan. Oh, we'll have to do with apples, said Lucy. Do let's get on. We've done nothing yet, and we've been here nearly two days. And anyway, no one's going to have my hat for a fish basket again, said Edmund. They used one of the raincoats as a kind of bag and put a good many apples in it. Then they all had a good long drink at the well, for they would meet no more fresh water till they landed at the head of the creek and went down to the boat. The children were sorry to leave Care Paravel, which, even in ruins, had begun to feel like home again. The DLF had better steer, said Peter, and Ed and I will take an oar each. Half a moment, though. We'd better take off our mail. We're going to be pretty warm before we're done. The girls had better be in the bows and shout directions to the DLF because he doesn't know the way. You'd better get us a fair way out to sea till we've passed the island. And soon the green wooded coast of the island was falling away behind them, and its little bays and headlands were beginning to look flatter, and the boat was rising and falling in the gentle swell. The sea began to grow bigger around them, and in the distance, bluer, but round, close round the boat, it was green and bubbly. Everything smelled salt, and there was no noise except the swishing of water and the clop-clop of water against the sides, and the splash of the oars, and the jolting noise of the rowlocks. The sun grew hot. It was delightful for Lucy and Susan in the bows, bending over the edge and trying to get their hands in the sea, which they could never quite reach. The bottom, mostly pure pale sand, but with occasional patches of purple seaweed, could be seen beneath them. It's like old times, said Lucy. Do you remember our voyage to Terebinthia and Galma and Seven Isles and the Lone Islands? Yes, said Susan, and our great ship, the Splendor Hyaline, with the swan's head at her prow and the carved swan's wings coming back almost to her waist, and the silken sails and the great stern lanterns, and the feasts on the poop and the musicians. Do you remember when we had the musicians up in the rigging playing flutes so that it sounded like music out of the sky? Presently, Susan took over Edmund's oar, and he came forward to join Lucy. They had passed the island now and stood closer in to the shore, all wooded and deserted. They would have thought it very pretty if they had not remembered the time when it was open and breezy and full of merry friends. 
Phew, this is pretty grueling work, said Peter. Can I row? Can't I row for a bit, said Lucy. The oars are too big for you, said Peter shortly, not because he was cross, but because he had no strength to spare for talking. Chapter 9 What Lucy Saw Susan and the two boys were bitterly tired with rowing before they rounded the last headland and began the final pull up Glasswater itself, and Lucy's head ached from the long hours of sun and the glare on the water. Even Trumpkin longed for the voyage to be over. The seat on which he sat to steer had been made for men, not dwarves, and his feet did not reach the floorboards, <clears throat> and everyone knows how uncomfortable that is, even for ten minutes. And as they all grew more tired, their spirits fell. Up till now, the children had only been thinking of how to get to Caspian. Now they wondered what they would do when they found him, and how a handful of dwarves and woodland creatures could defeat an army of grown-up humans. Twilight was coming on as they rode slowly up the windings of Glasswater Creek, a twilight which deepened as the banks drew closer together and the overhanging trees began almost to meet overhead. It was very quiet in here as the sound of the sea died away behind them. They could even hear the trickle of the little streams that poured down from the forest into glass water. They went ashore at last, far too tired to attempt lighting a fire and even a supper of apples, though most of them felt that they never wanted to see an apple again, seemed better than trying to catch or shoot anything. After a little silent munching, they all huddled down together in the moss and dead leaves <clears throat> between four large beech trees. Everyone except Lucy went to sleep at once. Lucy, being far less tired, found it hard to get comfortable. Also, she had forgotten till now that all dwarves snore. She knew that one of the best ways of getting to sleep is to stop trying, so she opened her eyes. Through a gap in the bracken and branches, she could just see a patch of water in the creek and the sky above it. Then, with a shrill of, thrill of memory, she saw again, after all those years, the bright Narnian stars. She had once known them better than the stars of our own world, because, as a queen in Narnia, she had gone to bed much later than as a child in England. And there they were, at least three of the summer constellations could be seen from where she lay, the ship, the hammer, and the leopard. Dear old leopard, she murmured happily to herself. <clears throat> Instead of getting drowsier, she was getting more awake with an odd nighttime dreamish kind of wakefulness. The creek was growing brighter. She knew now that the moon was on it, though she couldn't see the moon. And now she began to feel that the whole forest was coming awake like herself. Hardly knowing why she did it, she got up quickly and walked a little distance away from their bivouac. This is lovely, said Lucy to herself. <clears throat> it was cool and fresh. Delicious smells were floating everywhere. Somewhere close by, she heard the twitter of a nightingale beginning to sing, then stopping, then beginning again. It was a little lighter ahead. She went toward the light and came to a place where there were fewer trees and whole patches or pools of moonlight, but the moonlight and the shadows so mixed that you could hardly be sure where anything was or what it was. At the same moment, the nightingale, satisfied at last with his tuning up, burst into full song. <clears throat> Lucy's eyes began to grow accustomed to the light, and she saw the trees that were nearest her more distinctly. A great longing for the old days when the trees could talk in Narnia came over her. She knew exactly how each of these trees would talk if only she could wake them and what sort of human form it would take put on. She looked at a silver birch. It would have a soft, showery voice and would look like a slender girl with hair blown all about her face as, and fond of dancing. She looked at the oak. He would be a wizened but hearty old man with a frizzled beard and warts on his face and hands and hair growing out of the warts. She looked at the beach under which she was standing. Ah, she would be the best of all. She would be a gracious goddess, smooth and stately, the lady of the wood. Oh, trees, 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 said Lucy, though she had not been intending to speak at all. Oh, trees, wake, wake, wake. Don't you remember it? <clears throat> Don't you remember me? Dryads and hamadryads, come out, come to me. Though there was not a breath of wind, they all stirred about her. The rustling noise of the leaves was almost like words. The nightingale stopped singing as if to listen to it. Lucy felt that at any moment she would begin to understand what the trees were trying to say. But the moment did not come. The rustling died away. The nightingale resumed its song. Even in the moonlight, the wood looked more ordinary again. Yet Lucy had the feeling, as you sometimes have when you are trying to remember a name or a date and almost get it, but it vanishes before you really do, that she had just missed something, as if she had spoken to the trees a split second too soon, or a split second too late, or used all the right words except one, or put in one word that was just wrong. Quite suddenly she began to feel tired. She went back to the bivouac, snuggled down between Susan and Peter, and was asleep in a few minutes. 
It was a cold and cheerless waking for them all next morning, with a gray twilight in the wood, for the sun had not yet risen, and everything damp and dirty. "'Apples, hey-ho,' said Trumpkin with a rueful grin. "'I must say you ancient kings and queens don't overfeed your courtiers.' They stood up and shook themselves and looked about. The trees were thick, and they could see no more than a few yards in any direction. "'I suppose your majesties know the way all right?' said the dwarf. "'I don't,' said Susan. "'I've never seen these woods in my life before. "'In fact, I thought all along that we ought to have gone by the river.' "'Then I think you might have said so at the time,' answered Peter, with pardonable sharpness. "'Oh, don't take any notice of her,' said Edmund. "'She always is a wet blanket. "'You've got that pocket compass of yours, Peter, haven't you? "'Well, then, we're as right as rain. "'We've only got to keep on going northwest. "'Cross that little river, the, what do you call it, the rush?' "'I know,' said Peter, "'the one that joins the big river at the fords of Baruna, "'or Baruna's Bridge, as the DLF calls it. "'That's right. "'Cross it and strike uphill, "'and we'll be at the stone table, "'Oslan's how, I mean, by eight or nine o'clock. "'I hope King Caspian will give us a good breakfast.' "'I hope you're right,' said Susan. "'I can't remember all that at all.' "'That's the worst of girls,' said Edmund to Peter and the dwarf. "'They never carry a map in their heads.' "'That's because our heads have something inside them,' said Lucy. "'At first, things seemed to be going pretty well. "'They even thought they had struck an old path. "'But if you know anything about woods, "'you will know that one is always finding imaginary paths. "'They disappear after about five minutes, "'and then you think you found another "'and hope it's not another but more of the same one, "'and it also disappears, "'and after you've been well lured out of your right direction, "'you realize that none of them were paths at all. "'The boys and the dwarf, however, "'were used to woods and were not taken in "'for more than a few seconds.' They had plodded on for about half an hour, three of them very stiff from yesterday's rowing, when Trumpkin suddenly whispered, Stop. They all stopped. There's something following us, he said in a low voice, or rather something keeping up with us over there on the left. They all stood still, listening and staring till their ears and eyes ached. You and I'd better each have an arrow on the string, said Susan to Trumpkin. The dwarf nodded, and when both bows were ready for action, the party went on again. They went a few dozen yards through fairly open woodland, keeping a sharp lookout. Then they came to a place where the undergrowth thickened, and they had to pass nearer to it. Just as they were passing the place, there came a sudden something that snarled and flashed, rising f out from the breaking twigs like a thunderbolt. Lucy was knocked down and winded, hearing the twang of a bowstring as she fell. When she was able to take notice of things again, she saw a great, grim-looking gray bear lying dead with Trumpkin's arrow in its side. "'The DLF beat you in that shooting match, Sue,' said Peter, with a slightly forced smile. Even he had been shaken by this adventure. "'I—I I left it too late,' said Susan in an embarrassed voice. "'I was so afraid it might be, you know, one of our kind of bears, a talking bear.' She hated killing things. "'That's the trouble of it,' said Trumpkin, "'when most of the bears have gone enemy and gone dumb. "'But there are still some of the other kind left. "'You never know, and you daren't wait to see.' "'Poor old Bruin,' said Susan. "'You don't think he was?' "'Not he,' said the dwarf. "'I saw the face, and I heard the snarl. "'He only wanted little girl for his breakfast. "'In talking of breakfast, I didn't want to discourage your majesties "'when you said you hoped King Caspian would give you a good one, "'but meat's precious scarce in camp, and there's good eating on a bear. "'It would be a shame to leave the carcass without taking a bit, "'and it won't delay us more than half an hour. "'I dare say you two youngsters, kings, I should say, know how to skin a bear.' "'Let's go and sit down a fair way off,' said Susan to Lucy. "'I know what a horrid, messy business that will be.' Lucy shuddered and nodded. When they had sat down, she said, "'Such a horrible idea has come into my head, Sue.' "'What's that?' "'Wouldn't it be dreadful if some day in our own world at home "'men started going wild inside like the animals here "'and still looked like men so that you'd never know which were which?' "'We've got enough to bother about here and now in Narnia,' said the practical Susan, "'without imagining things like that.' When they rejoined the boys and the dwarf, as much as they thought they could carry of the best meat had been cut off. Raw meat is not a nice thing to fill one's pockets with, but they folded it up in fresh leaves and made the best of it. They were all experienced enough to know that they would feel quite differently about these squashy and unpleasant parcels when they had walked long enough to be really hungry. All night trudged again, stopping to wash three pairs of hands that needed it in the first stream they passed, until the sun rose and the birds began to sing and more flies than they wanted were buzzing in the bracken. The stiffness from yesterday's rowing began to wear off. Everybody's spirits rose. The sun grew warmer, and they took their helmets off and carried them. "'I suppose we are going right,' said Edmund about an hour later. 
I don't see how we can go wrong as long as we don't bear too much to the left, said Peter. If we bear too much to the right, the worst that can happen is wasting a little time by striking the great river too soon and not cutting off the corner. And again they trudged on with no sound except the thud of their feet and the jingle of their chain shirts. Where's this bally rush got to, said Edmund a good deal later. I certainly thought we'd have struck it by now, said Peter. But there's nothing to do but keep on. They both knew that the dwarf was looking anxiously at them, but he said nothing. And still they trudged on, and their mail shirts began to feel very hot and heavy. What on earth? said Peter suddenly. They had come, without seeing it, almost to the edge of a small precipice from which they had looked down into a gorge with the river at the bottom. On the far side the cliffs rose much higher. None of the party except Edmund, and perhaps Trumkin, was a rock climber. I'm sorry, said Peter. It's my fault for coming this way. We're lost. I've never seen this place in my life before. The dwarf gave a low whistle between his teeth. Oh, do let's go back and go the other way, said Susan. I knew all along we'd get lost in these woods. Susan, said Lucy reproachfully, don't nag at Peter like that. It's so rotten, and he's doing all he can. And don't you snap at Sue like that either, said Edmund. I think she's quite right. Tubs and tortoise shells, exclaimed Trumpkin. If we've got lost coming, what chance have we of finding our way back? And if we're to go back to the island and begin all over again, even supposing we could, we might as well give up the whole thing. Moraz will have finished with Caspian before we get there at that, at that rate. You think we ought to go on, said Lucy. I'm not sure the High King is lost, said Trumpkin. What's to hinder this river being the rush? Because the rush is not in a gorge, said Peter, keeping his temper with some difficulty. Your Majesty says is, replied the dwarf, but oughtn't you to say was? You knew this country hundreds. It may be a thousand years ago. Mayn't it have changed? A landslide might have pulled off half the side of that hill, leaving bare rock, and there are your precipices beyond the gorge. Then the rush might go on deepening its course year after year till you get the little precipices this side. Or there might have been an earthquake or anything. I never thought of that, said Peter. And anyway, continued Trumpkin, even if this is not the rush, it's flowing roughly north, and so it must fall into the great river anyway. I think I passed something that might have been it on my way down. So if we go downstream to our right, we'll hit the great river, perhaps not so high as we'd hoped, but at least we'll be no worse off than if you'd come my way. Trumpkin, you're a brick, said Peter. Come on, then, down this side of the gorge. Look, 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 cried Lucy. Where? What? asked everyone. The lion, said Lucy. Aslan himself. Didn't you see? Her face had changed completely and her eyes shone. Do you really mean, began Peter. Where did you think you saw him, asked Susan. Don't talk like a grown-up, said Lucy, stamping her foot. I didn't think I saw him. I saw him. Where, Lou, asked Peter. Right up there, between those mountain ashes. No, this side of the gorge, and up, not down. Just the opposite of the way you want to go. And he wanted us to go where he was, up there. How do you know that was what he wanted, asked Edmund. He, I, I just know, said Lucy, by his face. The others all looked at each other in puzzled silence. Uh, Her Majesty may well have seen a lion, put in Trumpkin. There are lions in these woods, I've been told, but it needn't have been a friendly and talking lion any more than the bear was a friendly and talking bear. Oh, don't be so stupid, said Lucy. Do you think I don't know Aslan when I see him? He'd be a pretty elderly lion by now, said Trumpkin, if he's one you knew when you were here before. And if it could be the same one, what's to prevent him having gone wild and witless like so many others? Lucy turned crimson, and I think she would have flown at Trumpkin if Peter had not laid his hand on her arm. The DLF doesn't understand. How could he? You must just take it, Trumpkin, that we really, we do really know about Aslan, a little bit about him, I mean, and you mustn't talk about him like that again. It isn't lucky for one thing, and it's all nonsense for another. The only question is whether Aslan was really there. But I know he was, said Lucy, her eyes filling with tears. Yes, Lou, but we don't, you see, said Peter. There's nothing for it but a vote, said Edmund. All right, replied Peter, you're the eldest DLF. What do you vote for, up or down? Down, said the dwarf. I know nothing about Aslan, but I do know that if we turn left and follow the gorge up, it might lead us all day before we found a place where we could cross it. Whereas if we turn right and go down, we're bound to reach the great river in about a couple of hours. And if there are any real lions about, we want to go away from them, not toward them. What do you say, Susan? Don't be angry, Lou, said Susan, but I do think we should go down. I'm dead tired. Do let's get out of this wretched wood into the open as quick as we can, and none of us except you saw anything. 
Edmund, said Peter. Well, there's just this, said Edmund, speaking quickly and turning a little red. When we first discovered Narnia a year ago, or a thousand years ago, whichever it is, it was Lucy who discovered it first, and none of us would believe her. I was the worst of the lot, I know. Yet she was right after all. Wouldn't it be fair to believe her this time? I vote for going up. Oh, Ed, said Lucy, and seized his hand. Now it's your turn, Peter, said Susan, and I do hope. Oh, shut up, shut up, and let a chap think, interrupted Peter. I'd much rather not have to vote. You're the High King, said Trumpkin sternly. Down, said Peter after a long pause. I know Lucy may be right after all, but I can't help it. We must do one or the other. So they set off to their right along the edge downstream, and Lucy came last of the party, crying bitterly. The story continues with chapters 10 through 12 on the next recording.